Welcome to the Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon. Calvary meets in the Joppa Falston area between Baltimore and Bel Air, and our pastor is Josh Plantholt. Come join us on a Sunday. Our service info is at calvarychapelbaltimore.org. And now, here's this week's teaching. Uh, well, welcome to Palm Sunday. <clears throat> I'd like to turn your attention this morning to the 12th chapter of John. (laughs) Today, we are going to read of an event called the Triumphal Entry. Doesn't that have a ring to it? Uh, And one of the things that we want to keep in mind moving forward is that the life of Jesus is described across how many different books? Four. We got the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these four books, praise God, do not say the exact same things in the exact same details. What would be the purpose of four identical books? Right? They would be copies. So some gospel writers decide to put in some events, and other gospel writers decide to put in other events. Uh, uh, where they didn't need to necessarily feel to cover what someone else covered. So, for example, only John has Nick at Night, the story of Nicodemus on the rooftop. Uh, And, for example, only Matthew and Luke cover Jesus' birth story. Now, you'd think, why doesn't everyone carry, you know, cover little baby Jesus? Well, Matthew, you know, uh, uh, Matthew and Luke did, so John didn't feel the need Uh, If we're going to be fair, John started a little earlier at Genesis 1-1. But so all four Gospels are telling uh, the story of Jesus, but each from their own unique perspective or from a certain theological angle. Uh, Well, here we are today at the triumphal entry. And this is one of those rare stories in the Gospel that is recorded in all four accounts. Point being, today's story was so essential, it's so significant, that all four gospel writers felt compelled to add it to their story of the good news, the story of the gospel. And they think John maybe wrote his gospel last, and he saw that the first three guys wrote it, and he goes, I'm going to do it too. So it it was a must to communicate. Now, All four gospel writers recorded this event in Jesus' life, yet, but yet we're we're not told the same things verbatim four times. So they all add their own unique emphasis. For example, if you go through Matthew's account, you'll notice he keeps talking about the donkey. Like, (laughs) Matthew doesn't move past the donkey. In fact, he spends more time talking about uh, the donkey Jesus was going to ride on than the actual ride. The triumphal entry. He packed longer for the trip than the trip itself. <laughs> to Matthew, the, this donkey uh, c- connection is, is, a, is a, uh, pointing to a passage in the Old Testament from Zechariah 9, which John quotes here today. And to Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, this was foundational that they connected the Zechariah 9 figure to Jesus. And so he really emphasizes the donkey. Uh, Mark does something uh, different. He structures the triumphal entry amongst a long series of Jesus' travels. It's like an itinerary, it, it reads like. And what Mark ends up doing is connecting the triumphal entry to a passage in Leviticus 14. To Mark, Jesus' coming into the temple is connected to a passage in Leviticus on mold removal. And Jesus is going into the temple, he inspects it, he leaves. He comes back, he flips over the tables because everything's still dirty. He comes back, he leaves, and he goes, this whole thing's got to get torn down. And that's where we have the parable, of, that's where we have the withered fig tree. Uh, the, the fig tree was representation of the temple. It looked like it had fruit, but it, it bared none. And it, it needed to be chopped down, it needed to wither and die. And Luke, uh, similar but different to Mark, Luke puts the triumphal entry in the midst of a bunch of parables describing the wickedness of evil servants. And it is in Luke that Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, where Jesus describes how Jerusalem will be destroyed. Luke is describing the wickedness of those who run the temple. And I'm preaching this on next Palm Sunday, and I'm already excited. So I'm a year excited built up for this. Uh, But... Here we are today in John's text, 
And John places the triumphal entry between the resurrection of Lazarus and the testimony of the resurrected Lazarus. So John places the emphasis on not only what he did in the life of Lazarus, but who was going to accept that sign of a resurrection and who isn't. And so there's this real who's going to accept the resurrection motif sort of a thing that's happening here. Uh, and it's sandwiched in between the story of Lazarus. So let's, let's jump right in here. Uh, let's actually start at John 12, 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who, uh, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. The boy, doesn't that describe a lot of churches? The Lord needs your money. I need my 15th Tesla and my third beach home, please. Uh, you know, <laughs> thieves. <clears throat> Verse 6, and he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief having charge of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So that was last week's text. That was fun. Uh, now new territory, verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. As you can imagine, many people from all over the region came to mourn the death of Lazarus. We heard that large crowds were there. Mary has tons of money. They seem to be a very, be a very prominent family. Uh, in fact, Bethany's two miles away from Jerusalem. So a way to think about this is they're in the suburbs of Jerusalem. Uh, they, they have the nice house uh, and they commute to work possibly. But they, they, have, they, they seem to be a family of quite some means. And if you're a family of quite some means, it means you're a family of quite some business. And if you're a family of quite some business, that means you're a family that deals with lots of people. And so people seem to come from all over the place to mourn the death of, death of Lazarus, who must have been a good man. Then everyone finds out Lazarus is alive Jesus of Nazareth, of all places, raised him from the dead. And so all these people who are in Jerusalem, two miles away, uh, that are there for Passover week, hear that Lazarus is alive, and they all start coming to see Jesus and Lazarus. Verse 10, so the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Isn't that so evil? We, it's not enough to kill the man. We have to kill the memory of the man, even if that means killing more men. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Now remember that Jesus and Lazarus are in Bethany, which is about two miles away from Jerusalem. Now, this time in Jerusalem, people are starting to arrive for Passover week. That means there's tons of festivals, feasts, festivities. How many other F words can I come up with? But there, there were so many things happening there uh, that came with the Passover. And the early Jewish historian Josephus said that when he was in Jerusalem around 60 AD, maybe a little later, there were 2.7 million Jews in Jerusalem around this time. That doesn't include Gentiles who came to see it. So there are likely millions of people in this city. Now, what we just read were that large crowds were coming to Jesus in Bethany, meaning what? The people are leaving Jerusalem, the temple of God, during a holy week to go see Jesus and Lazarus. 
imagine, I was trying to think of a good equivalency here. Imagine it's Christmas Eve at the Vatican and millions of Catholics are there. The Pope's making agreements, he's shaking hands, he's kissing babies, he's giving speeches, he's got his cool chair, mine's better, but we don't need to go there. And everything's gearing up for the Christmas Mass where we all hold the candles and oh, say Maria, you know, you do the thing. And two miles away, outside of the Vatican, there's a preacher who is very critical of the Vatican. And he's speaking. And huge crowds start to leave to listen to that guy. Now to the popes and the bishops, this would be a, to the pope and the bishops, this would be a very serious problem. Well, that's what's happening. Huge crowds are leaving Jerusalem and the temple of God during Passover week and are going to Bethlehem to hear from Jesus. It's no wonder the Pharisees and the chief priests are starting to have freak out mode that's starting to kick in. People are walking away from the temple of God to get closer to God. To see Jesus and Lazarus has been raised from the dead. So now they're going, we got to kill Lazarus. They're in full blown meltdown mode here. <clears throat> Verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard uh, that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So, large crowds have been leaving to go see Jesus. Large crowds are already with Jesus because he's got his disciples. We know there's probably the 120 with him and God knows who else. And now huge crowds start leaving Jerusalem to greet him on the road. So everyone's flooding out of Jerusalem during Passover week to see Jesus. So, verse 13, they took branches of palm trees and went out and went out uh, to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. There could be as many as tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people greeting Jesus into Jerusalem here. That's a lot of people. And they wave palm branches, and there may be some connections to the palm here, to the Feast of Booths, if you have ever heard it put that way. Uh, the problem is the Feast of Booths is a few months away. So the, the, it might be connected, it may not be connected. The, the, the reason, uh, though, so many people may be waving palms and laying them out uh, for Jesus may be because the palm was the national symbol of Israel at this time. So during the Maccabean Wars, if you um, so in between Malachi and Matthew, there's 400 years. Uh, things happened within those 400 years. One of those things were the Maccabean Wars. And when Simon the Maccabees drove the Syrian forces out of the Jerusalem citadel, he was celebrated with music and the waving of palm branches. So it may be that the Jews are greeting Jesus as a coming conqueror as a new Maccabee, coming to liberate Jerusalem from the hand of Rome. And this may explain why they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. The crowd starts shouting the words out of Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. Uh, and Hosanna, Hosanna originally meant save us, though later it became a type of blessing or praise, which seems to be the way that it's meant here. Um, but the, the Pharisees, the people are waving palm branches like he's their liberator. They're, they're, they, we, we see in other accounts, they're throwing their extra tunics on the ground. They're rolling out the red carpet for Jesus and his donkey to come riding through. And, and, and the reason they throw their cloaks on the ground, it's symbolic of them bowing down at his feet. So everyone's bowing at their, his feet symbolically. And now they're calling him the king of Israel. Now they're connecting in the Psalm 118 as Jesus is the coming Messiah. And so the Pharisees hear this and they start losing their mind because people are connecting the Messiah from Psalm 118 to Jesus. And they're doing this because of all that they've heard and all that he said, but also because he just raised the guy from the dead. <laughs> And then, and then when these large crowds not only speak blessing over Jesus, but call him the king of Israel. And the Pharisees in other accounts are mortified 
that Jesus doesn't correct them. Remember, they're like, can you shut these people up, Jesus? He goes, even if I told them to, the rocks would cry out. (laughs) The fact that Jesus doesn't correct them means he agrees with what they're saying. He is the king. And he will not tell them to be quiet because that would make him a liar. (laughs) And that makes him even more crazy. Uh, And then verse 14. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Uh, uh, John puts the least amount of all four gospels of the donkey. To him, it's just a little blip, uh, which, and then he, he just directly quotes Zechariah 9, again, connecting that, yes, the people believe that this is the Messiah, that he is the king, uh, but also scripture confirms this through Zechariah 9. So that, this, that is genuine. Uh, verse 16, I love this. I love whenever the disciples are confused. It makes me feel so much better. <laughs> His disciples did not understand these things at first. Thank God. But when Jesus was, you ever have that moment where like something's happening and then you look back and go, oh, I missed it completely. Well, you're not alone. Uh, His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. So now Jesus is riding in. And all these people are yelling Hosanna, and all these travelers to Israel, uh, Jerusalem are going, what is this? Is this the king? Did we miss something? And then all of these little evangelists Jesus has that were there when he resurrected Lazarus start telling the story. They start filling them in, which I think is wonderful. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So everyone wanted to see the guy that could raise someone from the dead. Uh, So the crowds are here in such large large number because they wanted to see someone again who could raise someone from the dead. And then verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. So now the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests and the leaders of the law, they all start looking at each other and start yelling at each other. If Jesus won't listen and the crowds won't listen, it's got to be the idiot next to me who caused this problem. Uh, You ever see two workmen start bickering with each other over something they both have created? (laughs) Uh, And so uh, another way that this reads, the Pharisees say to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. That's uh, almost a more literal translation there. They're essentially saying their approach to shutting Jesus down thus far has not worked at all. Despite their approach, Jesus' popularity has not diminished, it's only grown. And think about it. The Pharisees have been banking on the fact that people would respect their opinion and estimation of Jesus. And yet this crowd shows the exact opposite. Despite as much as they've been calling this man a heretic... Those tens or hundreds of thousands of people don't agree with you. And so they're coming face to face with the reality that they don't have the respect that they thought they had. Um, Then they say, look, the world has gone after him. Now, they're not saying, look, all the people follow him. So I I don't know if you know this, and it's hard to pick it up in English, uh, but the Bible can be pretty funny sometimes. Uh, God is God is a God of humor. Uh, I, I point to this one a lot. I love when I love in the book of Judges when Gideon's hiding in the wine press and Jesus shows up to him and he goes, "Hello, mighty man of valor." <laughs> He's quaking in his tunic, hiding, you know. Uh, or King Eglag, he was so fat he gets stabbed in the stomach and the sword disappears because he's so fat and he poops himself and dies. Uh, <laughs> You know, the, there's the potty humor of the Bible. Deal with it. Uh, so the, the Bible is funny sometimes. That's okay. Uh, you know, Christians should laugh. Uh, but what, what, what here John is adding some humor in here for us. Uh, they're not saying, look, the whole world is following him, but rather the whole of creation is following him. The, the word for world here in the Greek is cosmos. 
they, they start yelling at each other and go, the whole universe is following this man. Uh, this language is exaggeration. They're, they're, they are at the end of themselves. They are so frustrated. They look and there's all these crowds of people cheering Jesus and we find out that the Gentiles are there and they just have a malfunction. Are you kidding me? The whole freaking planet loves this man. And they start losing it. Um, and then verse 20. So John wants us to pick up on that and giggle a little bit. Uh, now among those who went up to Galilee at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew to, and Philip went and told Jesus, and this will be our last verse, and pick up verse 23. This is, this is rather insightful. And Jesus answered them. So they come to Jesus and say, the Gentiles want to speak to you now. And remember, this whole time, Jesus has been focusing on the house of Israel. He's been focusing on the Jewish people. Now he finds out the Gentiles want to come to him. And listen to verse 23. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And that's today's text. <sighs> I'm going to get into this in tomorrow's Bible study a little bit, but it was the, the Gentiles now coming to faith was the sign that Jesus' ministry on earth as it was, was over. It was time for the disciples to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and sent out to all the ends of the globe. Um, I, I have one thought here today, and I know that is a miracle, but one thought... <laughs> One of the things that John is communicating to us plainly in his account of these events is that there were some who truly wanted Jesus and there were some who truly didn't. And paradoxically, those who should have wanted Jesus, the people who spent their life studying the Bible, didn't, the chief priests and the Pharisees. And those who likely should have rejected Jesus, the Gentiles, actually wanted them. So it's easy to paint the chief priests here as the villains, but the reality is too, if we think about it, a lot of these Jewish people cheering Hosanna this day would be demanding Jesus' death in just a little while. They say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. They say, here comes the King what are they going to say when, he, when Jesus stands trial? We have no king but Caesar. <laughs> I'm thinking of Psalm 118, the declaration of the king, the psalm. This movement, the triumphal entry, a great way to think about it is it reads like the coronation of a king, doesn't it? Behold, we have a new king. A new king coming into a city to receive honor but Jesus knows full well that this is a false coronation. Because a lot of the people, again, that are cheering for Jesus are cheering for him because they want something from him. What do they want Jesus to do here? Overthrow the Romans. They want a military leader. That's what they want. When, I think it's in Matthew. Jesus walks into the temple and he, you remember it says, you den of thieves, you den of robbers? Uh, there, there's a large speculation that that, that, word, that verbiage is connected to nationalistic hopes, that they set themselves up as a nationalistic fortress, a stronghold. It wasn't about God at all. It was about Israel and this identity. And once they realize that Jesus is not interested in fulfilling their plans and overthrowing Rome, they will turn on him and demand that he be killed. Now, one of the things I believe today's passage is presenting to us in, in the strongest terms is Jesus' kingship. That's why I love, you know, Maria's saying all these songs about Jesus as the king. I was like, yes, God's going to do something today. You see, all of these people wanted Jesus as their king. As long as he was the ki a king made in their image. As long as he acted in a way that they wanted. And so one of the things, again, I believe today's passage is presenting to us that we all need to grapple with for ourselves is do we want Jesus as our king? 
Or do we want him as our pawn? Most people will sign up for Jesus if they believe him to be a a magic genie. (laughs) They will sign up for Jesus if his whole goal is to give you your best life now. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Declare it and it'll be so. (laughs) Tell that to Paul. So many people are quick to believe in Jesus as this magic genie, but, but quick to reject him as their Lord. And this is all throughout the New Testament. So many people rejected him because he wasn't who they thought he should be. The chief priest rejected Jesus because he was kind to the Gentiles. They went into full freakout mode. He likes those other people. The Pharisees and the rabbis rejected Jesus because he was kind to sinners. How could he let those prostitutes sit at his table? If he was a prophet, he'd know what sort of people these were. So many people in this crowd will reject Jesus because he wasn't interested in creating an army and overthrowing Roman captivity. Actually, tomorrow, the day after the triumphal entry, is when Jesus walks into the temple and starts turning over the money-changing tables. If a lot of these people were hoping for Jesus to be a Maccabean-type figure, a Davidic-type military general, general, then him flipping over tables in the temple must have felt like a great betrayal based upon their expectations of who Jesus, the Messiah, was supposed to be. So many people rejected Jesus because he wasn't who they expected him to be. He wasn't who they wanted him to be. Jesus didn't fit in the box box that all these groups demanded that he fit in. And this is the first thing I want us to wrestle with this morning. Again, is do we want Jesus as our king? Or do we want him as our pawn? Do we want him to fit in a nice little box for us and he does as we please? Don't reject God because you have a demand (laughs) that he be a certain way or he doesn't fit into some box you have for him. What I'm saying is if you're really going to accept that Jesus is the king, uh, the savior of sinners, your savior, then you better, you must accept how he decides to rule and to save. I love what verse 16 says in today's passage. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Oh, While all these people have these expectations of who God needs to be, isn't that nice? John has no problem admitting he has no idea what's going on. (laughs) The disciples have no idea for what's happening here. And what I'm realizing is they knew Jesus just enough to realize they didn't know. You notice, particularly young people, things can be real black or white. But as you mature, you realize life's kind of messy. And, and, and things are difficult sometimes. And sometimes there's an answer that's a little yes and a little no. Uh, you know, uh, I'll give you a, just the one off the top of my head. Um, you know, should I start fasting? I, I, oh, sure, but <laughs> uh, is there, do you have sin in your life? Maybe you get rid of that first before you fast. Do you see what I'm saying? There's... There, there's, there's, there's nuances to this, things to this. And, and when you spend enough time with Jesus, you realize that life is a little messy. You know, I love that story when, when all the people bring the woman out in adultery and they're all ready to throw rocks at her and Jesus starts writing his, in the dust with his finger and they all start backing away going, Mm-mm, I don't like where this is going. And they think he's writing their sins in the dirt. And when, he, and when he's done, he looks up, they're all gone, but the woman and he goes, oh, your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. I love that. But, but it's messy. Yeah, you're forgiven, but you got to clean your life up. It's not just, yes, you're forgiven, go keep sinning. You know, that's a yes and a no here. There, there, there was repentance. In here. And so John, they, the disciples, they realize they have no idea what's happening. <laughs> um, 
a little story here. I remember, God, I'm getting old. I know that sounds ridiculous to so many of you, but about a decade ago, ugh, about a decade ago, I, um, my wife was doing something. I didn't have kids. It was after church on a Sunday. Everyone was busy. So I was going to go home. I was going to eat way too much food and melt on my sofa while watching something. It sounded like a glorious Sunday afternoon. And I'm driving home, and I get the strongest sense in my heart. I need to go to this place called Jerusalem Mill. Has anyone ever heard of Jerusalem Mill before? It's this little waterway with like picnic benches that you can sit there. And I'm thinking in my head, I don't want to go to Jerusalem Mill. I want to go home. I got to eat, Lord, you know. <laughs> so I'm on my way home, and I'm like, I don't know. So I drive past it. But I go, and it's out of my way, but I was like, I'm just going to go home. So I open, and I hear it again. I strongly go to Jerusalem Mill. I literally said out loud, no, I don't want to go. I kept driving. I am almost to my house a third time, and I knew it. I knew I had to go. So, okay. So I turn around. I drive 20 minutes back to Jerusalem Mill. I get there, there are two elderly gentlemen, one's playing a banjo, the other playing a guitar, and they both look like they stepped out of Woodstock, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so I listen to their songs, and I have my Bible with me, and I go, okay, so I go down to the water, I read my Bible, I think it was John now that I'm thinking about, I had a great devotion, I said, okay, the Lord wanted me to spend some time with him. Could have done this over a rack of ribs, but okay. So I <laughs> closed my Bible and I walked up and I'm, I'm walking and the guys finish their last song and they start packing up and they're in their late 60s, 70s. And I'm a young man with no, nowhere to go at this point except for a rack of ribs that I had planned on eating. And so I said, oh, let me help you with your stuff. I said, sure. So the arrangement was I had them hold my Bible and I carried all their gear. And I'm thinking, okay, they just need to know where my charity comes from. This is from the Lord. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I help them load up their car and, you know, we, we were talking. It was great. Uh, and then they leave and I leave and I felt, finally feel like I'm at peace. I go, okay, I just needed to plant a seed. You know, I just needed to plant the seed. So I, God's going to do with it what he does. I drive home. I get home to my town home in Abingdon. I get out of my car. I grab my Bible out of the back seat. And sure enough, that same car drives slowly past me and parks. Oh. I'm 20 minutes away. Wow. I go, what are you doing here? They go, we live here. What are you doing here? They were my neighbors from five doors down. Which explains why it smelled like Woodstock in the backyard all the time. <laughs> if you catch my drift. Um, and so I was like, you have no idea. The Lord drove me to church. And I just told them the whole thing. The Lord has a plan for you. I'm telling you. And they looked at me probably too high to understand what I was saying, but I, I let them have it. Uh, and, and my point is, you know, there are times when God is doing something that you have no clue why he's doing it. There are times where none of it adds up or it's just so confusing. You ever think, God, why am I doing this? I mean, you know, maybe you're thinking, why are you doing this? You know, hear me, a condition... A condition for something to be used or useful by God is not if you understand it. <laughs> God's plans are not only good if you agree. <laughs> At the same time, Jesus is still Lord even if you don't understand something. Or maybe even if you dislike his leadership at times. I'm going to be brutally honest here. Aren't there times where life is really hard? And you go, you, you say you're God, and my kid's throwing up on me all night before Palm Sunday. I don't understand this. And then there are times where, where our circumstances can be, seem so brutally unfair. You ever felt that before? This is unfair. You know, but ask yourself, is Jesus only your Lord and Savior when he works the way you want him to? This passage makes a little more sense now, doesn't it? Yeah. Does Jesus stop being king when illness strikes? When death comes? When finances get tight? When anxiety and depression hit an all-time high? 
Loved ones, don't put God in a box. Don't demand him to work a certain way. He is the king, not us. <laughs> One of the greatest ways to shipwreck your faith is to have expectations of God that are not in his word. You know, a really clear lesson that we can learn from today is don't, is don't tell the king how to be the king. Just trust the king. You know, right now I'm reading Pilgrim's Progress. So good. Oh, man. No one told me to read it sooner. You're all, you know, you're all in sin for that. No, I'm reading it. At one point, his wife is yelling for him. She, she, she doesn't want him to take this journey. Christiana is her name, and they, she has sons. And he goes, no, I must follow the king's highway. And she yells at him, please don't do this. Please don't do this. And he plugs his ears and runs. And he goes, eternal life, eternal life. I must have eternal life. There are times where we just have to drown everything out and say, Lord, you are my vision. You are my goal. You have, I love what Polycarp said when they told him the recant. He was an 80-something-year-old man who they were going to burn alive. And he said, the Lord has been good to me these 80-some-plus years. How could I reject him now? We must follow the king's highway. You know, this... In this story, this is part of the story of the wilderness wanderings in the Exodus People, if you ever read through the book of Exodus, have you noticed the people never stop complaining about God's leadership? Wow. They just never stopped. They, God needed to work a certain way and he didn't do it. So they thought he was the problem. Who did that ultimately end up hurting? The people, not God. If Jesus is your king, then let him be your king. Let him rule as he sees best because he's a little smarter than you. Let him rule the way that he sees best and follow. That's what faith is, the assurance of things hoped for and unseen. You're not going to have it figured out. It's not going to seem perfect. At times it's going to seem a little hazy. But do you trust him? Do you trust him? When things do not seem to be working the way that you hoped that they would. And you know what? Let me tell you something. Praise God. Praise God that he's on the throne and not us. huh? <laughs> Praise God that he's in charge and not us. Praise God that the kingdom of heaven is not a republic. Can you imagine what a disaster it would be if he made his choices based upon church vote? We don't want any trials, Lord. Mm -mm, no. We, we are all going to hit the mega millions this week, Lord. You know, just think about it. Would it not be the most disastrous thing in the world if God always gave you your way? Now, maybe, maybe you're thinking here, I don't know, that sounds pretty nice. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Have you ever met a truly spoiled rich person? Or just someone who's just, you know, some people are just born feeling entitled. Those people are fun. <laughs> There's no depth of character. Even in the Garden of Eden, you know we were told to work hard for six days and rest for one. It's not good for man to rest six days and work one. And in our fallen state, the Bible tells us that our struggles, our sufferings produce character. You would have no depth of soil if God never let trial come into your life. If he never grew you in patience or forgiveness. You know, I love what Paul, I love Paul here in 2 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited. This is Paul. Isn't that awesome? Paul knew he would become conceited if God didn't do something. Don't think yourself more highly of don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me 
to keep me from becoming conceited. There's a chiasm there. I won't get into it now. Paul said that God allowed Satan to harass him in order to keep him from becoming conceited. There are times when the king allows trials for the good of his people. I know I've shared this before. But when my, about three years ago, my disc in my lower back didn't slide out, it exploded. Like a water balloon, just boom. And I was partially paralyzed, I couldn't walk, it was a nightmare, I had surgery. And I remember I, I was crying so hard because I realized I couldn't get on my knees and get back up. And it was so important to me every day to get on my knees and to recognize that Jesus is my king. Otherwise, I would become conceited. I had to recognize that. And even to this day, when I'm having some back issues, I always try to get on my knees because I know what's in me. And it is that pain that I have asked him to take away from me so many times, and I know you guys have asked him to take it away from me. And I pray that he does, and I hope that he will, and I believe that he will, but he's allowed it for the good of me. You know, I love that Spurgeon quote, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. You know, Paul goes on to say again in Corinth, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that he should leave me, that it should leave me, this harasser from Satan. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And here God does not answer Paul's prayer three times. Have you ever had God not answer your own prayers before? You think, what's wrong with me? Hmm. Hello? <laughs> I'd like you to answer here. But maybe it's for your own benefit. God didn't answer Paul for the good of Paul. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. There's a lot to say here, but to stick to our theme, and boy, I would love to preach this one day. As hard as it is sometimes, from an eternal perspective, it is so good that Jesus is the king and not us. Because we would never opt in to deepen our own characters and to become more Christ-like. Now I'm saying all this because at the triumphal entry, the Jewish people wanted Jesus to kill the Romans. That was what the Jewish people thought would be the greatest thing that God could do. That that's the kind of Messiah that the people needed. But God had a much more glorious plan than destroying Rome. He was going to die for Rome. He's going to die for the cosmos. God's plans were infinitely greater than anything humanity could conceive of. And in seven days on Easter Sunday, Jesus is going to die on the cross, and not just for the sins of one country, but for the sin of the whole world. Jesus didn't come to earth for, for the good of one nation. He came to earth for the good of all nations. Heaven is going to be filled because Jesus came not as the king man wanted, but as the king man needed. And if you're going to find yourself in heaven, it's going to be because he's the king, not the king that you wanted, but the king that you needed. And if you have faith in Jesus Christ and he is your king, then again, you will be in, uh, in heaven for the rest of eternity, not because he ruled uh, are, are, you'll be in heaven because he ruled and not according to a group vote but according to his holy and perfect standard so trust him if he's earned anything it's our trust trust his perfections trust in his plans even when it seems to make no sense trust in his character Trust in his nature. Trust the king, for he is faithful and true. Amen? Um, before we sit at his table, 
I know we're running a little long, but it is the Lord's Day. I want to close with a few scripture verses here, and then we'll take communion. Real quick, if anyone needs a communion cup, uh, please raise your hand. Rob will hook you up. And I just want to say before we get into communion, to sit and take communion means you are sitting at the table with the Lord. To sit at the table with the Lord means you are at peace with the Lord. You are not at peace with the Lord unless your faith is in Jesus Christ as Lord. So if you are not a believer, I ask that you abstain from this meal because you're not at the table. It would be a sham. If you are a believer, please enjoy it. Take it with us. And maybe this is the first time you've ever heard anything like this and you want to be at peace with God. Then you are most welcome at his table. Take this and let it be a remembrance that you are at peace with your God on Palm Sunday 2023. (laughs) That was the day you sat down and you ain't ever getting back up. You will be his and he will be yours. Um, So before we do communion, I first want to read a few scripture verses. Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Trust Him. Romans 11.33 Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has ever been His counselor? He is so much wiser than us. Trust Him. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He never changes. He is always persistently, consistently good. 1 Timothy 1.17 Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's take communion here. Want to grab the bread first? Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessed, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Thank you, Jesus. And he took a cup, And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. God, we love you. What a joy and a privilege to sit at your table. God, we so adore you. But the reality is not as much as we should. So God, deepen us. Deepen our understanding. Deepen our trust. Deepen our hope. Deepen our love. Deepen us, God. We pray for depths of soil that your word may come into our lives and spring fruit. And God, we pray that where there is hard ground that you may till it and break those rocks. (laughs) Our life is but a vapor and when we are dead, all that we've done will echo through the rest of eternity. What is a few years of discomfort in light of eternity? And so, God, please, please, please move in us in a tangible and a profound way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you. We pray that if anyone needs prayer, that they may receive it. A prayer with our prayer team off by the side. And God, please move in us mightily again and send us out in a fresh and a powerful way. And in Jesus' name, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship. Thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary, Baltimore. We'd love to hear from you. Send us an email with your questions, prayer requests, or just to say hi. 
Our email address is calvary.faithlife at gmail.com. If you'd like to donate to support the work God is doing through Calvary Baltimore, go to calvarychapelbaltimore.org and click Donate Now. And if you're in the area, stop by on a Sunday morning. For directions and service times, go to our website at calvarychapelbaltimore.org. If you can't be here in person, we also live stream on our website and on our Facebook page. We hope you've been blessed by this week's teaching. Until next time, as Pastor Josh says, study the Word to live the Word to share the word and join us again for the next Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon.